Hello, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to Generous Futures, Delivering Inclusive Healthcare. My name is Teresa Chan and I am the founding dean of the School of Medicine at Toronto, Toronto Metropolitan University. We are excited about this panel today. And I can't wait to hear from this esteemed group. Before we begin, I would like to start with a land acknowledgement. TMU is located in the Dish with One Spoon territory. The Dish with One Spoon is a treaty between the Ashtanag Bay, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the lands. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans, and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. I would like to take the opportunity to also thank our lead sponsor for this series, TD Bank Group for helping bring generous futures to all of you. We simply couldn't do this without TV. Today, we are looking at the role of philanthropy plays in the shaping of healthcare to be more inclusive. We'll explore how systemic inequities need to be addressed in Ontario and Canada, and how community support can bring meaningfully great change to healthcare delivery, especially as TMU looks forward to opening its doors to a new school of medicine in Brampton in 2025. The plan for the next 45 minutes is straightforward. After we have a chance to hear from each of the panelists and engage in conversation, I'll do my best to get to the questions that many, you have, many of you have pre-submitted in registration. All right, so without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce you to our panel. First is uh, Justin Boyd. And so we're gonna... Um, put a uh, screen up and hopefully you can see Justin now. And uh, Justin is president and creative director of the Hoy Agency, a full service award-winning marketing and advertising agency based in Toronto. He's an alumnus of the Toronto Metropolitan University and he graduated in 1993 with his degree in radio and television arts. That sounds so interesting. Justin is also very active in charitable and uh, community efforts, establishing himself early on as a leader and role model in the Chinese Canadian community. He participates in many philanthropic causes and sits on more than 20 boards and committees, such as Sick Kids Foundation and Trillion Gift of Life. Justin supports education and healthcare through scholarships, including the Justin Poi Media Award at TMU and the Justin Poi Endowment Fund at the Kidney Foundation of Canada. Justin is also a recipient of TMU's Alumni Award of Distinction. Welcome, Justin. All right. Next, we have Sukhip Khan. Sukhip is a qualified telecommunication engineer, migrated to Canada in 2001, and created a, uh, created a history by being the first South Asian female immigrant to join the Peel Regional Police. This is a really important work to get involved in the, uh, the, uh, the region of Peel and being able to help with some of these governance structures. Her virtuosity was recognized then as she was appointed to the Criminal Injury Compensation Board by the government of Ontario in 2006. Her entrepreneur acumen led her to establish Armour Insurance Brokers Limited in 2010, the first immigrant female-owned insurance brokerage in North America. Sukhdeep orchestrated the Armour flagship to become national brokers and made it a multi-line award-winning brokerage. Her benevolence and community service are well recognized and she has been appointed to the board of directors for William Osler Hospital Foundation and has raised over $6 million in cancer research support and to advance healthcare systems. She has also sponsored various youth-focused sports leagues and sponsored fundraising for Bethel Hospice, which earned her the Women Hero Award from the Ontario Ministry of the Status of Women. Thank you for joining us, Sufi. Next, we have Atif Baskandiri, who is the CEO of North Pine Foundation, a startup that is one of the most giving philanthropy foundations in Canada that supports ventures to achieve scalable outcomes for underserved and under-invested communities in Canada. Their starting portfolios include refugees, formerly incarcerated persons, Scarborough, rural and remote Newfoundland and Labrador, and localized food system for climate, um, climate change kind of uh, support. North Pine develops uh, 
that deploys almost uh, $500 million annually through gifts, grants, loans, equity, and balanced finance, while building deep relationships with its portfolios and organizations as they pursue their ventures. Atev is also the co-founder of Salam Bai, an award-winning documentary and anti-racism education initiative. His previous work spans leading innovation across different sectors and communities. His educational background was engineering, social policy, and technology management. Welcome, Atta. Wow, it's such an incredible honor to be with you all in this panel today, and I'm really excited to start this discussion. All right, so now um, I'd like to start by asking a question of each of you first, and then, uh, sorry, uh, one question common to all of you, and then I'll target some questions to each of you, okay? So um, perhaps what I can do is I can ask, um, why is it that it is so important to bring together a conversation about philanthropy, generosity, and healthcare delivery in this particular time? Great. I will. Uh, I'll. I'll start uh, the yeah. answering here, Teresa. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much, Teresa, for having me join the panel today. Um, well, first of all, um, what a lot of people need to understand. Um, and I'm not even sure all Canadians understand this, um, but certainly uh, newcomers to Canada don't understand how our healthcare system is even funded. Um, you know, it's funded by several factors, um, especially in the in the province of Ontario. Yeah, there's the Ministry of Health and the the the, the bureaucratic agenda and whatnot. But as we know, uh, government only pays for certain portions of our healthcare system, and the rest is up to the generosity of Canadians. And uh, if you look at um, you know any healthcare environment, hospitals, clinics, you'll see how important philanthropy is. You see the the namings and and all the individuals and corporations that do their part in uh, contributing. And philanthropy drives um, you know many of the campaigns that are either generally funded or directed uh, funding. And people usually give to the areas that have affected them personally or somebody they know and care for. Well. It's important now at this particular time to look at this because COVID taught us a lot about the uh, inequities of our system. Um, and we'll probably get into this a bit later, but you know, philanthropists in general tend to give in the areas that um, have affected them. Um, and I can say for myself, from my own personal experience, um, you know, here on, on, the, on, on this panel, we have a foundation, we have corporations, and everybody has their own mandate of, of why they want to give. And so what happens is um, if the whole system is not overlooked, is not, is not looked at as uh, at holistically, then there are areas that are going to be overlooked, and that is what creates um, the inequity. So we need to look at the whole landscape as philanthropists, but also the system needs to look at the whole landscape. Because philanthropists, I mean, we are not the, um, the the professionals on the ground. We can give to things that we know and that we want to support, but it's really the system that is going to have to look at where the need is and and let philanthropists know where you know where which areas need the most funding. Um, you know, for lack of a better term, people usually give to you know quote unquote um, popular. Um, subjects, uh, uh, subject matter, or areas that are of immediate concern, or maybe there's something that's uh, highlighted in the media, you know, for example, during COVID. Um, but what about, you know, funding for marginalized communities? What about healthcare centers that are located in geographic areas that aren't filled with uh, entrepreneurs, successful business people? And how do we spread philanthropy across the board so that there's equitable funding? Um, it always strikes me, first of all, at um, how it's always the same small minority of individuals and corporations that are always giving. So I think that alone is creating some of the inequity. Um, and I think that when you look at our province and if you've been to many hospitals like I have, you'll see that some hospitals are amazingly equipped. And then you've got some hospitals that are still using operating suites that haven't been upgraded since the 1950s. Um, so I think what we need to do as philanthropists is all come together um, and really look at uh, the needs for people from all walks of life um, and, and really um, uh, figure out, you know, what exactly we are missing, because I'm sure that philanthropists will come and step up to the plate um, when, they're, when they're called upon. Um, you know, the, um, 
there was one other point I wanted to hit. Um, Okay. I mean, you can think about it. Yeah, I think that's, yeah, I think, yeah. no, I think that's, that's pretty much it. Yeah, that's pretty much it. For okay. Yeah. I, I was going to say, because I think you've really segued nicely into something that Sadiq is um, very uh, well known for her engagement with the hospitals and working with them to partner and figure things out with their board. So Sadiq, I was wondering if you wanted to add to what Justin said. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for giving me opportunity to be on the board. And um, uh, I would second uh, what Atif uh, had just said. I've been, um, you know, speaking on in, uh, along those lines to people, to the community, and uh, wherever I go, um, I believe, uh, you know, COVID really taught us. Uh, COVID really made us aware uh, where we are lacking, where the where we need the funds, and um, yeah. Prior to that, I even I was not aware. I never knew that uh, being in Canada for almost 23 years, I never knew that hospitals are not funded for equipment um, and by the government. And it was kind of strange. It was uh, you know one incident where one of my friends, she basically gave me the awareness. And after that, I started speaking to people. And once COVID hit us, I was more into it. And um, um, when we talk about philanthropy and generosity, I believe it it exists in every culture, it exists in every race and gender. All we have to do is, uh, since healthcare is um, facing more challenges than ever, and we do not want to repeat our mistakes that we have done in the past, as we were not prepared as a Canadian to combat with the, uh, the uh, impacts of COVID. So I think for, to build a better future, to build better hospital, to bring our own doctors, to build our own doctors, I would say we do need more money um, in uh, or we need to narrow down our focus into healthcare system and um, where we are educating our doctors, producing our own doctors. I think it will be really um, a much needed area to work and uh, to focus on. And I will encourage um, whomever is involved to narrow down uh, their focus into uh, the healthcare system uh, to make Canada to live and uh, work as the best place. And Atif, I mean, you've always been someone who's an advocate for um, combating racism. And today, in today's age, I think that's really, really important. Do you have anything to, to, to bring in from your vantage point? Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Peace be upon you all. Um, in regards to how we look at marginalized communities and how we think about racism, I'm going to touch on a few points that both uh, Justin and Sukhdeep brought up, which is, I would call it the, uh, the broken relationship between philanthropy and healthcare and also where there's opportunities. Uh, I'll also make a note of an important typo, uh, Teresa, when you first said North Pine gave out $500 million annually, that's one too many zeros. <laughs> it's not $50 million, $50 million annually. Fair enough, sorry. <laughs> when you said that, I was like, oh, wow, my budget has increased dramatically. <laughs> um, but Maybe that's the future state. That's, the, that's what there you go. Future state. Right? Yeah. Future state. Um, but you did, but it's an interesting thing. I'll talk about some of the broken pieces. And when we think about this, what I will call the, the nebulous term of racism, I'll talk a little bit of how it looks and how it can look in a very innocuous way. And I'll tell the story of Scarborough. So Scarborough in the east end of Toronto, uh, a population of 50% uh, newcomers, 74% people of color, have about 10 to 15% lower income than the rest of the GTA. Uh, but when you look at hospital infrastructure spending over the past 20 years or so, you will find billions of dollars uh, being invested in healthcare infrastructure <laughs> all the way from Milton out west to Ajax out east. And there's an interesting data point that we saw by Scarborough. It's the number was zero. There was no money invested in uh, healthcare capital projects in Scarborough during that time. Well, you see billions el elsewhere. And it is an interesting thing that Justin brought up that I think is critical to what I think is broken with the relationship between philanthropy and healthcare. It's, as was mentioned, and Sakthi, you even mentioned it on the equipment costs, we actually don't have a fully public healthcare system. Huge, huge chunks of it are reliant 
on philanthropy. But the problem with that is, and it's been brought up, is that philanthropy is consequence of proximity to wealth, proximity to issues of interest of that wealth, or what happens to be popular. So if you happen to live in Scarborough, and you're not surrounded by a lot of wealthy people, or you're not able to make it of interest or of popular to a lot of wealthy people, we have a provincial policy in Ontario that says a local hospital foundation needs to fundraise 10% of capital costs before the government will come in with the remaining 90% and they have to pay for all the equipment costs. So what that means is you are structurally will always have poor health infrastructure based off of your proximity to wealth. And then we know the social determinants of health, which is ironically, these are the areas that you want to invest the most in healthcare, if you look at the social determinants of health. So the, the story of Scarborough, and this is kind of the North Pine perspective, but when we went into Scarborough and we were shown this, um, it's something where our board, uh, our founders, uh, John and Dr. Kathy Phillips, really amazing people who are trying to do great things across Canada, um, they happened to live in Scarborough. They heard these stories. They started to get more engaged. And they saw what Scarborough did, which was, and I'm going to talk about the, the elephant in the room. The elephant in the room, I'll talk about not just the philanthropy in healthcare, but the politics of healthcare. So the elephant in the room is people in Scarborough, if you look at what gets political attention, how much do you get political attention? Uh, when is it the right time to be fundraising for a hospital in order to get the government commitment to build that hospital? <clears throat> so even though the Scarborough Health Network went for the $100 million raise to get the billion dollars of infrastructure that they've been promised for many years that have never been built, uh, North Pine decided to go in. At that time, it was the first largest donation. Thankfully, there have been many people who have outdone us. God bless them. Um, we went in for $20 million. And our goal for the $20 million was to catalyze the flywheel to get to the $100 million. Thankfully, Scarborough did it. They got to the $100 million. And then a few months before the election, the government gets to commit to a billion dollars in infrastructure in Scarborough. So I think it's important when we talk about the link between philanthropy and healthcare, we talk about the link between politics and healthcare mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. proximity to wealth and proximity to these kinds of influential decisions that are being made. And there's a lot of social determinants of health that are intermingled, including racism as a factor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I see a lot of nodding and I think there's a lot of wisdom as well, what you're pointing out. I mean. Uh, I think when you're thinking about the real world and how things interact, you can't escape money, politics, and people being intertwined, right? Um, and I think that uh, I think that I'm learning a lot from all of you. So thank you. Um, I have a question now for Justin. To so I go back to you, I know you have a deep personal connection to healthcare. Um, can you tell me tell me a little bit more about how that influences uh, your work in this area? Sure, absolutely. First of all, I want to start by saying, Ajiv, thank you. That like your whole thing about Scarborough. My father uh, did his entire medical practice at Scarborough General. He was the chief of the burn unit there. And if you ever want to experience time travel, go have surgery at Scarborough General Hospital because literally it, that the ORs are, they, they, they have not changed since the mid 1950s. Um, and, um, and, and so thank you for bringing that up. Um, so first of all, uh, a part of my CV that nobody ever reads and I've never put in writing is that I'm actually a three-time kidney transplant recipient and a cancer survivor, and I'm actually on dialysis right now and uh, and waiting for a fourth kidney transplant, unfortunately. So, um, you know, I've been uh, through our healthcare system, but I've also uh, been treated in the United States. And, you know, um, I would say as, as a patient, our system is far superior. I mean, wait times are really not that much shorter down there. Um, uh, yeah, you can, you can pretty much pay for anything, but you don't necessarily get the best advice when it becomes a commercial transaction. So number one, I have a huge amount of respect for our healthcare system and I deeply appreciate the, um, the philanthropy that happens now, um, for me, it's, uh, it's typically the grateful patient and for my parents who donate as well to uh, healthcare and, 
and through my experience, uh, that would be grateful patient family. Um, that is a very strong connector um, for uh, going out and getting donations, obviously. Um, you know, I remember um, I, when I was asked to join the Sick Kids uh, Foundation Board, it really was, you know, it was, it was a, a, a sort of a time capsule kind of meeting, but, you know, they, they talked to me about my experience and, and, you know, I've always wanted to give back to sick kids. Um, my uh, first transplant was there in the early eighties. And that was, you know, obviously my early teens, it was very formative. And, um, and that's the same reason why I've given to the kidney foundation. Um, and uh, I think that when we look, especially at healthcare, it's really, what is that personal connection? Or you try and make uh, some sort of tie, whether it is to somebody um, personally or, you know, and then for me, um, you know, I'm acutely aware of the things that are needed, uh, especially after I've, you know, done a, a stint in the hospital. Um, so that's usually where I might approach the hospital foundation and say, look, I noticed that there's a, a gap here. Um, and, um, you know, and, and very often, I guess the one major point I'd like to make is that hospital foundations need to listen to patients and they need to listen to patient families. Um, when, you know, not every physician is used to looking at a patient holistically. Uh, when I was a kid at Sick Kids, I would go to my clinics. As long as that kidney transplant was functioning, sign you off and away you go. If I was depressed, if I had social issues, if I was experiencing anxiety, um, you know, self-esteem issues from side effects of medication, they weren't always things that, um, that they looked after. And now I found out, I just did a podcast a few weeks ago, um, which had some folks from Sick Kids. Uh, this was for uh, um, the transplant program. And it turns out that Sick Kids is now listening to patients and has developed programs as a result of listening to patient families. So I think that's that's a huge um, a huge area, and for me, yeah, I I uh, I give based on what I've experienced and what my family has experienced through me, but also I would like them to listen more. Um, I think that if they listen, especially on the foundation side, you know, if the hospital listens but doesn't translate that or or transfer that to the foundation or vice versa, then that's sort of useless. I think everybody needs to be communicating and really listening because. The people who are right there on the front lines are, yes, the healthcare workers, but also the patients as well. Yeah, I think that's a really great point. And mm -hmm. um, speaking of which, communicating and listening, I mean, Sudeep, uh, we've been trying to listen to the Brampton <laughs> community for some time as we're building the School of Medicine. And I do think that it's really, it's been, been super powerful to listen to people like yourself and others who are intimately involved in that community to see how we might be able to be responsive to that. Um, can you share a little bit more about, like, for instance, what are some features within the community that you have been serving, um, you know, through the Peel uh, Police Department uh, Board or uh, through the William Mosler Board? I mean, you clearly have also been a leader and, and listening to that same community. Do you, can you walk me through kind of how you think through that process of how to engage people in that and, and when you're on listening? I would say, uh, you know, being um... Being Bramptonian, being in, uh, I will say, reason of appeal. Um, and um, as we all are aware that we, it's the fastest growing um, reason. And uh, it's a newer community as compared to the other area. So the challenges are new. And the, even sometimes when we talk about discrimination or racism and all that, sometimes we feel that way. But at the same time, I also give, uh, I also look at, at positively that, you know, people are still learning about us. People are still learning about the culture. People are also still learning about uh, the challenges. Um, the, I would say the Canadian, um, our, our community is also, uh, when I say our community, it's like I'm talking about Bramptonian. So we are still learning about the system. So it is kind of, there is a, a big um I will say there is a it's a transition. Uh, it's a time of where the community is transitioning, and so does the government. But for sure, um, I will say South Asian community, which is kind of highly populated in uh, Brampton and Mississauga, they're more uh, aware. They are more uh, who like to participate in uh, um, in um, you know 
all sort of um, political uh, levels, like a municipal uh, or provincial or federal. So they raise their voice, they raise their concerns. Uh, we've been uh, in being in uh, being Bramptonian, we face probably more challenges in hospital. I have I have not uh, been to Scarborough Hospital, but our hospital is not uh, any better either. And uh, since I'm a board member, I know more. When people ask me oh, what is happening, why this is not happening, why that is not happening, now being a bit aware, uh, since I'm on the other side, I share my view forwards and people would say, wow, we were not even aware. We were not even aware. So there is a lot where I will say again, I will come back to the pinpoint is awareness and education, which I'm not sure who will spread. Will that be the foundations um, who are there to raise funds or will that be hospital? Will that be community leaders? Will that be uh, you know, the political or I'm not sure who, who there has to be some sort of a, a system where we make each and every one aware that we do need, uh, we need do need funds. We do need to operate our hospital. We do need to build our universities. We do need to build our doctors, and also kind of narrow down the focus. What is priority? Mostly, mm. you know, being an immigrant, we are all grateful. Many of us came here for a reason, for the betterment of life. And we are all so grateful. I will say Brampton has produced many success stories, many success stories, and people are so grateful. It's a diverse country, uh, a diverse uh, city. And we have, and I was reading, uh, it was 2021 when they um, said there are over 250 um, uh, ethnic tourism. So you can imagine like whoever came from wherever they came, they all are kind of well settled in Brampton. They are, it's a great place to live and work. And now we are in a stage and age where we want to give back and where we give back, um, that is the, that education is required. And that education will only come from, it has to come from the, I will say, um, you know, authenticated sources. It has to, uh, I will say we need to go more on radio. We do need to go more on TV shows. We need to be on the, the newspaper. We have to be there to educate people. I would not, you know, I may have, or I would not say that I'm not guilty of thinking discrimination or racism or whatnot. But today I will say that those things, we can leave everything aside, but focus on that, we are going through transition and we have to focus on the better side of our life. And that is where I believe that awareness and education is required. Yeah, thank you very much. I think that's um, well, really well said. And I think um, maybe I'll turn to Atif because you're leading a very generous philanthropy startup. Um, North Pine Foundation has given, like you said, $50 million um, and and, and obviously that doesn't come out of any, like that doesn't come out of um, nowhere, right? Like you educated yourself, you understood, you have given a masterclass and explaining it obviously, because you just did it very well at the top of the hour. Um, how do you take on this as you are leading this foundation, as you are working on delivering that inclusive healthcare? How, how, do, you, how do you approach that problem that uh, Sukhdeep is talking about? Some of the things that we do at North Pine is I'll boil back down to the root definition of the word philanthropy. The root definition of the word, word philanthropy is love of humanity. It doesn't say charities, nonprofits. It doesn't say grants or donations. It says love of humanity. So if we boil down into philanthropy, we said, okay, how do we want to activate our love of humanity? And we have these resources, which is money. We said, okay. Well, we believe that 99.9% .9 of people out there in the world are kind of people that want to be on a common mission towards betterment of society. How is it that, number one, we can build bridges across all these people in society to kind of get to that big vision that we have for Canada? And more tactically, what that meant is, as a foundation, we will work with anyone from any sector. You could be a charity nonprofit, you could be a private sector company, you can be a government organization, we don't care. 
and we will use any financial instrument. It could be a grant or a donation, could be debt, could be equity. We just say whatever makes sense for the impact model that we're trying to build. And then what happens is once we say we open up the doors to all these different sectors and all these different financial models, it allows us to enable and catalyze everyone in society to be part of this common mission. And how is it that we all can express our love of humanity uh, in our own ways towards this common mission? So at North Pine, we funded everyone from every sector. We've done all kinds of financial instruments, but the most important thing for us is what catalyzes impact for the communities that we are aiming to work with and how do we do it in a scalable way? And I'll kind of end off on, this is kind of our challenge and hopefully the opportunity mm -hmm. is if we get to better coordination among all these diverse people mm -hmm. in society of how we can work together, that is how we can truly scale impact. The challenge with philanthropy right now is sometimes it's very one-off. Like one group does something here, one group does something there. There's no real coordination of effort to build that kind of scalable impact in society. Uh, so just much love to all those bridge builders out there trying to build connections between people. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that bridge building, bringing people together, um, people with common background, right? And I think one of, uh, probably everyone on this call has a connection to being somewhat connected to newcomers, whether that's directly because you are a newcomer yourself or you're born to newcomers like myself. Uh, my parents were newcomers at some point to um, to Canada. Um, and, um, you know, I think it's really important for us to, to think through how do we engage that group? Because I think there's big demographic sh shifts uh, because uh, a, a lot of the philanthropic sector right now um, might be from people who have come from abroad. Um, and, and so I think uh, this this goes to both uh, Justin and Sukhdeep because you've mentioned it quite a bit, um, but maybe we'll go to Justin first. Do you have any thoughts on how we might be able to welcome um, those who might have uh, have really just recently come to the um, Great Mission of Canada? Sukhdeep, you hinted at it earlier, but I'd love to hear what Justin has to say on this. And then Sukhdeep and Nati, if you want to jump in, that's great. Sure. Um... Well, first of all, this is a communications issue. And before you can encourage anybody to do something, you need to, well, they need to understand what you're talking about first. And um, philanthropy is seen very differently in uh, many countries. Um, and, you know, I'm very familiar with the People's Republic of China. Um, in countries such as China, philanthropy is a very new concept. Um, and in some cases, it doesn't even exist. And unfortunately, um, you know, uh, charities uh, and charitable programs um, have been plagued with scandals in China. And so what happens is um, when uh, a lot of people have immigrated to Canada, uh, they still have that that tainted um, image in their head. And I've been asked many times, I mean, even when I was on the Sick Kids Foundation board, it, it just flat out, they would they would ask me, is this legitimate? You know, and they'd ask me to the biggest thing was to prove that sick kids was a legitimate foundation. You know, you have to bring them down. They want to see the, you know, knock on the bricks, make sure it actually is a functioning hospital. Um, there have been some some real doozies of scams in, in China. So, um, you know, and, and the other thing is you have to look at the, the political system that people come from uh, and you have to understand that. So, for example, in China, it is understood well, on paper anyway, that the state looks after everybody. The, the Communist Party of China looks after everyone. So how is it that somebody would donate money and put their name on a hospital and they take, they're take they taking care of you? That just doesn't exist. Um, you, can't, you can't even name anything like that in, in China. So um, that's number one. Number two, once they get here, um, you are going to have a language and culture barrier. And sometimes I feel like the culture barrier is even more important than the language. Um, so I give you an example, if a family comes here and very often a family from China would come here with school age children or university age children as a charity, you may have to do some work on the children, um, to get through to the parents and many donations have been made that way, where it was actually the children that sort of translated everything, um, in the Canadian context and then, and then made their parents understand and therefore they give. Or you may actually have to wait the entire generation and wait for that younger generation to grow up and they will be the donors. 
And I always tell, you know, any charity that asks me, they say, is it worth it to go after that community? And I say, well, if you don't do it, somebody else is going to do it. And so you may as well lay the groundwork, um, uh, start to cultivate the younger generation, um, because as soon as they either inherit wealth or uh, grow into the family business or start business, very successful business of their own, they're the ones that you're going to be uh, wanting to talk to. Yeah. So get over the lack of understanding. Um, and then, you know, even basic questions. Anytime we do fundraising in the Chinese community, um, we always have to explain very implicitly how the healthcare system is run. Because the one question we always get asked is, why do I have to give money when the government pays for everything? Yeah, yeah it's true. I mean, I think I, I only very recently, you know, as I became a doctor and, and meeting with foundations of, of hospitals to understand why we can't afford an ultrasound machine, it was only then that I understood it's not something we talk about uh, with the medical students. We don't. I mean, we're going to try to change that in our new school of medicine so that understand the system a lot better. We're going to have a you know, course that runs four years around health system science. And for the residents, we're going to try to do boot camps to help them understand, because um, I think it's really important that we understand all of this so that we can move forward together. Right. Um, it doesn't make sense that people don't understand how they're going to get paid someday, but also how they're going to start a small business to be a family doctor, for instance, and be successful. But moreover, if they're going to work in the hospital like I do, they better understand how it works, right? So yeah. funding is one of those things. I mean, it's why I went and did my MBA because I just was like I had a huge part of my my education was missing. And it's I'm very grateful for that. So I need role models like you, Sukhdeep, <laughs> to be able to uh, to teach me uh, and Atif and Justin, you, you all are much more wise in this, right? So, but Sukhdeep, do you have anything to add around like how how and how we might be able to focus people towards, you know, resourcing and, and how we can bring people to those efforts. You know, obviously I have a vested interest in this school of medicine, but I think it's really more because of the overall um, fabric of how to support the uh, Brampton and Kyoto regions, right? No, I, I would say Justin has uh, said very well, it is important to understand. First of all, I have to know um, before I start promoting something. So if we have, if we uh, bring, if we involve community and educate them, like what is happening. And as he said, many people ask, uh, you talk about the um, uh, fundraising, they say, oh, you know, the CEOs are taking this much salary, or oh, the, uh, the people involved, they are taking big salaries. Why do we have to donate? Why do hospital need money? Why do uh, the university will need money? So uh, it is because, you know, coming from India, I never thought that doctors or hospitals will need um, public's money. I thought they are funded by the government. Same thing um, when, it, uh, when we talk with the university, like, you know, they are either private or public. There is no such thing as that, you know, partially funded by the public and um, uh, government. So for us, it is something new, but for uh, one thing for sure, I will say the South Asian community is a very loving, caring and giving. Um, and we are, uh, we, I would say um, in the past 20 years, the fastest growing community in Canada. And uh, we are doing a lot in many fields. Like if we were to, if you think of the temples that we build, if you think of the Gurdwaras that we built, the churches that we built, and, um, and helping each other to grow. So the community is doing a lot, but as the infrastructure is not really built to accommodate as much population as it is as fast it is growing so we have to make now the community aware that we do need to build more hospitals and we need to uh, this is i would say this is the once in a lifetime opportunity for Bramptonian in general and South Asian community for sure because we are highly populated there that the university is coming there and Again, being South Asian, I would say, or even uh, the Chinese culture, our uh, parents, all they want is our children to either become doctor or engineers. There is no third thing talked in our families, doctors or engineers. And many of the many of my family friends who have sent their children to USA, to other offshore country, even some of them have sent their children to India to become doctor, but the process is so long. They have to then go to US, then they have to pass some tests and all that. So why not focus in, um, um, in our own university and build it and uh, rather than you know, spending money in different countries, um, invest for the future. If not our children, our grandchildren or great grandchildren, someone will have benefit of it. And 
Um, I would say, you know, we should not even, uh, we should not be counting only on say 10 people or 15 people or 100 people. I think we should be reaching out to each and every uh, household in Brampton and sharing what is happening, what is happening in the healthcare, what is happening in uh, why university is asking uh, their support, why Brampton hospitals are asking for their support, why it is important, why we are left behind, why can we build the hospital as good as in other cities. So th those things have to be really, um, we should involve, include to everyone out there. I think that reminds me a lot of uh, your journey in Scarborough Artist, right? Like um, you, you with North Pine, you, you made that transformational seed or really kind of a seed donation for the Scarborough Health Network Foundation in 2022. Uh, um, and, uh, and I think that that gift, that story that you told about raising that community around that gift and so that others might see um, Scarborough as being invested, uh, sorry, a, a place where people would want to invest is really important. Um, do you have any thoughts on 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 how uh, to seed that kind of uh, enthusiasm in other communities? Because it's not just obviously Brampton or Scarborough. It's it's also in the north. It's also in other parts of Canada, as you pointed out, Newfoundland, Labrador, rural regions. I think there's a lot of people looking for a similar inspiration. So, any thoughts you have? Yeah, two words came to mind uh, when I was thinking about like the. The very complex journey of being a newcomer to Canada or a newcomer to any country and two words came to mind, which were certainty and accountability. And when I talk about accountability, I will say many newcomers and not just newcomers, many people in general. Um, they're, it's not that they're not philanthropic, they're extremely philanthropic. They all, like many, many communities come from collective cultures. If you kind of look at remittances of how many of these communities send money back home or to other countries, other Canada, it's enormous how philanthropic these communities are. The challenge is going to what Justin mentioned, which is the accountability side. And you know this, if you're in one of these communities, these conversations happen all the time. They're like the who's who. Everyone wants to donate money and they're always asking this five layers deep of the who's who, where's that money going? And they want to know where it's going. And so it's not that they're not philanthropic, it's that they care about accountability. They care that it's actually delivering on what it is that we all say is could deliver on. And the other thing is certainty. And so the, the funny joke in our family is, um, my my dad, uh, he he's an engineer. He actually came, he was like one of the millions of refugees that became refugees during the subcontinent partition. He ended up studying engineering in Japan, where funny joke on him, he didn't know he had to study in Japanese until he got there. And then he had to learn engineering in Japanese. Uh, and then he moved to Canada. Um, but when he came to Canada, he couldn't get a job as an engineer. And then it was a very precarious route for him to actually become an engineer. And he worked in the oil and gas sector. And for people who are familiar with oil and gas, it's a very uh, up and down eco uh, economy. So every four years you get laid off. So for my mom, it was her greatest fear for her kids to become an engineer because she did not see it as a certain position. She saw it as a very precarious position, getting laid off all the time. That was her exposure to it. So I think for newcomers, when you enter into Canada or a new country and with so much complexity, the greatest thing that you want is some level of certainty. You're striving for certainty. And that's kind of like a privilege that you don't have as a newcomer for so many. So they're, they're desperately looking for certainty. They really care about accountability, but inherently they have huge hearts, work in very collective cultures. And even when we went into Scarborough, we did nothing special. It's that community was just underinvested this whole time. Like, it's not like we had to do anything. The community was the one doing all the work because when you go into those places, no matter what, they're pulling together, they're figuring it out. They're operating in those 1960s surgery wards. Regardless, they're doing it. So it's just a matter of how do you find those underinvested spaces and just invest in them. And then you can see them do great things. <laughs> I mean, it sounds so much like the conversation we're having about really the world, right? You're trying to find high potential people and then invest in them. Um, they may not look like the traditional people that you always think are high potential. And it's about tapping into that potential. I mean, I think that really strikes home for me because that's that's what we're hoping to build, right? Um, is, is, is zones for people to flourish where um, 
they might, might not have had their hidden potential unleashed yet to the world. So that's amazing. Um, I'm going to change it up a little bit. Um, Justin, I'm going to ask you to look into a crystal ball with me uh, <laughs> and, uh, and talk a little bit about, you know, what equity issues do you think healthcare will face in the future, right? Um, hidden potential is one of those things, but being kind of like thinking about the future, how, how can how can we prepare for these? Like whether we're um, being philanthropic in the way that we're donating our talents, our time, or sometimes our you know treasure, right? Um, we we do talk about how we can engage in all of those things, but some of us might just want to give our time to these causes, and you know, where should we invest our time um, going forward? Okay. Uh, well, first of all, the philanthropic community, I don't think can do anything in a silo on its own. It has to be done in conjunction with those that are, you know, that are on the ground, that are seeing what's happening. And I, I think about this quite often, actually, uh, also because I'm, you know, <laughs> heavily invested on the patient side. So I'll give you a very, a very clear example. Um, you know, with, um, uh, I mean, no matter where you go, I mean, and Scarborough is a good example because they have a very large dialysis program under uh, Dr. Paul Tam out there. And um, the aging population, the increase um, intake of uh, uh, sugars, we're seeing more diabetes, diabetes unmanaged, you know, often leads to renal failure, aging leads to renal failure. We have so many patients on dialysis. Now, it's not just dialysis. I mean, that's we've known about dialysis for a long time, and the, the, the patient numbers are growing. I want to talk about the inequity. So let me tell you about the program I'm on. I am on a program. If you talk to somebody who's on dialysis, they, they'll tell you they feel awful, the diet's restricting and whatnot. But if you ask me, my experience is completely different. Why? Because I am in a program that not many people not many Canadians even get to be on. In fact, when I travel to other parts of the country and I tell them the program, the type of dialysis I do, they're amazed that we even have it. So if you go into a dialysis unit in the hospital, you'll see these big machines, either owned by Fresenius or Gambro. I have a Fresenius machine, a full-fledged machine, in fact, better than most hospitals, right next to my bed, fully paid for by the Canadian government, by the Ontario government, and not only that, I don't just do dialysis four hours, three times a week. I do dialysis however many hours I want while I sleep up to seven nights a week if I want to. So my blood results are infinitely better than the average Canadian on dialysis. Now, how is that? Well, a lot of that has to do with which hospital you go to. And that can sometimes be affected by where you live. So if I was in Scarborough, I'm going to the Scarborough unit. But if you live downtown, you get to go to Toronto General. Now, at the time I was living in Midtown, I was assigned to Toronto General. Now, even though I'm uptown, I'm still with Toronto General. They're the ones with the program. Now, who gets a machine uh, at home? Well, you have to be, you have to look after yourself. There's a lot of studying. Uh, you have to know everything pretty much a nurse knows and partially what the physicians know. So you have to be educated, highly educated. I, in fact, everybody I know on the program has at least an undergrad degree. So they're right there, you know, people from um, a, 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 a poor um, neighborhood will never get access to this type of treatment. Um, now, they may never get access because they can't manage at home. However, there are programs that I've seen where they have uh, satellite units where patients actually go in every other day and they sleep there and they are getting much more dialysis. Now, those cost money. So if we already know, and Dallas is just one example, I mean, we could look at oncology, we look, but if we know the trends of certain healthcare issues, especially the chronic ones that cost the most to the government, and we can project into the future how much it's going to increase by, if we can keep our patient population healthier, they are not going to be hospitalized as much. So that's going to be a huge reduced burden. So even if you had to open up a whole bunch of satellite clinics, and yes, there's an upfront bill, and you have to dialyze them more, there's more consumables. But you know what? Those patients are going to be hospitalized a lot less. They'll, some of them will be much healthier and ready for transplantation. These are the, these are the ways that we need to look at the future. And then, uh, then the, the, you know, the, the people on the ground, the physicians, the hospital management can calculate those numbers then engage the philanthropic community, make the case and say, this is what's happening. I think any philanthropist that heard, if you invest this amount of money, 100 patients will be hospitalized 10 times less. 
any philanthropist that really wants to make a difference is going to open up their ears and listen to that type of program. So I think that's just one example of how uh, we can plan for the future and try to avoid and minimize the inequity in treatment among patients here. Okay. Yeah, that's very profound. So really making a business case about where the future of healthcare is going Absolutely. and bringing everyone along for the ride. It's it's not really about doing anything special, but rather really taking what we already have out there and operationalizing it, scaling it really. But you know, the problem, Teresa, is that when this program first came out, the uh, Ministry of Health looked at the cost of the program. They're like, wow, machine for every patient, uh, triple the number of consumables. But then the physicians made the case and said, yes, but over time, these patients will never be hospitalized. And I've never had to be hospitalized for a renal issue since starting this form of dialysis. The problem is government, you know, working on four year terms, they, they don't look at, well, I'm going to be saving the, the Minister of Health in 12 years a lot of money. Right. So somehow we have to look at the whole picture holistically, it, not only in, in scope, but also in time. Yeah, I agree. I think there's a difference between politics and the way that they might think about it and uh, philanthropy, right? Because I think for the philanthropy, you can look at the, the you can love humans in the future as opposed yeah. to love the voters of tomorrow, right? Um, I think that there's a bit, bit of a different timeline where you're just loving humanity in general rather than, you know, one or the other kind of like uh, group. Um, I think that there's also importance for us to change the governments once in a while because we don't want to, you know, all the corruption that we talked about before, some of that comes from, you know, people not changing positions. So we're, we have to try to find a little bit of both. So I wonder if there's is this combination of, you know, the one, two step, the one step is about, about the government to think about the day to day. And then I think we can have the long, long uh, phase view when we're, when we're working in this sector and giving and, and working on building a better of tomorrow, right? Um, I think that when we're thinking about the next generation, uh, Sudeep, you are obviously a role model for myself and uh, many other women. Um, and I think that with uh, with women philanthropists, like we, we see a lot of men out there with their names on buildings and we don't see as many women. So I'm gonna ask you to talk a little bit about how, I mean, I mean, I think Justin's mom might be the exception, um, but I do think that, uh, that, that historically we have not been a group that gives um, maybe we don't give in a visible way right but you look at some of the um, big donations that have landed in the last couple of years they're not usually spearheaded as much by, by by women at the center of it and I was wondering if you have any thoughts on on how we might change that so again being a woman um, being first generation in Canada what I am um, and being in business this is a uh, I would say I'm the first generation in business as well. So uh, what I'm learning is, um, you know, women are much stronger, uh, but culturally the setup is in a way that they don't really tend to come forward. Uh, my focus other than my business is to um, create more women leaders uh, who can be on the tables when the negotiations are happening, who can be on the table when the, the questions being asked and they have the information to, uh, you know, uh, Give, give to whomever is there. And uh, I believe women are, personally, I believe women are much more stronger um, than we perceive, uh, but they have not made their place um, just by holding themselves at the back. And I think it is time women should come forward. They should be on the table. They should be involved in all the decision making. They should be, uh, when the when when they are kind of well settled, when they are comfortable, they should be giving back, and that should not be going through. Oh, you know, my husband or my father or my brother will do. They should be coming forward so that we can we can give um, we can be role model for our future generations. So I implore all the women, you know, to believe in themselves, to be strong, to you know stand for their rights, and give back to the community and create more leaders as we need them, we need more than we ever needed in the past. I think we've learned during the pandemic that many people can step up in different ways. So I think that call to arms is really important. All right, yes. I think we have, um, I think uh, I was gonna pivot to a question from the audience if you're up for answering one of those. Um, maybe I'll throw this to all three of you and you can each answer once. Uh, um, what are, 
the top three enablers that could help philanthropic organizations overcome the barriers when working on ADI and anti-racism. So if each one of you want to think about one enabler, that would be great. What's one, one thing that we could do to make it easier for everyone to work on this area? I will go to what Justin said earlier, focus on the person that you're trying to serve. I'll give you an example. If the majority of the people walking to your hospital are part of a vulnerable population, are the homeless or whoever they might be, how are you designing your system to best serve that population rather than whatever is the population that your donors might think need to be served uh, or even whoever thinks need to be served? At the end of the day, uh, when I think about how to design an equitable system is how are you designing by, for, and with the people that you're trying to serve? And then you end up building a, a more equitable system. So understand who it is you're trying to serve, who it is that has greater prevalence that could be underserved, and how do you design a system out for them? I'm thinking about the dramatic underinvestment, and just because we're talking about it, the dramatic underinvestment in women's health and women's health issues, that's a consequence of it. We shouldn't have to, I mean, ideally speaking, we shouldn't have to rely on more women becoming philanthropists before we design better solutions for women's health. Um, it should just, that should be the root of what it is that we're doing. Um, but yeah, I'll end off there. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, maybe uh, Justin, you're nodding. So do you have anything else you'd like to add? I mean, I just, just quoted you, so it's probably, <laughs> you might have stolen yours, I guess. Um, no, I, do you have any thoughts? Mm -hmm. No, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, you know, it is kind of a chicken egg situation, um, what comes first. But I think that, you know, healthcare is here to serve. Uh, let's let's serve people the, the, the right way. And if it is a, a worthy and a good cause, uh, people are going to step up to the plate and support it. Yeah. And Sudeep, I'll give you the uh, the honor of the last comment. Do you have any either comment on that question, or do you have any final thoughts that you'd like to? You'd I like think to Atif and Justin has covered it very well. I would second their opinion, and I think we really need to focus on. I was not even aware that inequities uh, exist in the healthcare system. I thought this is the best country where everybody is treated with the, you know, it's a fair treatment. <laughs> Uh, this is the, you know, today is the day that I learned about that. And uh, I think uh, we have to be above that. We are in the best country. We claim to be the, in the best country of the world. I think uh, let's step up and uh, serve everybody, whoever is there. All right. Like Suthi kind of pointed out, we definitely learned a lot today. So thank you so much for your thought-provoking answers to the questions. I'm sorry we can get to all the questions on the on the audience side, you had very, very good ones. I've typed the answer to some of the ones that um, certain individuals have thought about and, and care deeply about. I think we've been lobbying that, you know, organizations like our School of Medicine, like TMU, like um, the hospitals that we've mentioned, like they're wonderful. And I think it's about listening and engaging in the communities and the patients and the people at the center of it, right? Even especially those that are not at the table so easily because they are from, um, marginalized or equity deserving groups, right? Um, and I think that I want to thank you all, especially. Uh, thank you to well, go in order of speaking. So Justin, Sukhip, and Atif, thank you so much for being part of this panel. It's been a great discussion. Huge thank to our lead sponsor, TD Bank Group, for your work on this. And thank you to all of our other promotional partners, the Canadian Association of Gift Planners, Canada Helps, Imagine Canada, and Community, of Can uh, Community Foundations of Canada. I think that this wraps up season four of Generous Futures, and we're really excited to have had a chance to talk about all of this with you today. And thank you all for joining us for these conversations. <laughs>